Good morning. morning. It's good to be back. How many of you worried about slipping on the ice this morning or getting frostbite because it was too cold? Summer's here, isn't it? Oh my, I, I prefer the cold, I think. I don't like the hot and sticky stuff. But I love the flowers. I love springtime. I love all the bright colors people wear. You should see the difference from the front on a Sunday morning when you look out over the congregation. Once spring and summer hits and all the bright colors come out and everything looks so pretty. It's so good to have you all here today. Um, if you'd stand and, and join with me, our opening, uh, opening little chorus is, He Has Made Me Glad, number 214. Um, and our projector thing is still out, so we'll be using hymn books again, okay? He has made me glad, and in his heart I will enter his court with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice, for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. Yes, he has made me glad. I will rejoice, for he has made me glad. On the back side of your bulletin is a call to worship if you would join with me. We, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. Remember your congregation, which you have purchased of old, which you have redeemed to be the tribe of your heritage. You, O oh Lord, are enthroned forever. You are remembered throughout all generations. Nations will fear the name of the Lord, and all the kings of the earth will fear your glory. For the Lord builds up Zion. He appears in his glory. He regards the prayer of the destitute and does not despise their prayer. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Let this be recorded for a generation to come, so that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. Almighty God, we come today to praise you, to remember all that you've done in our lives, to remember what you've done in the life of this church, to remember what you did for us so many years ago on that cross. Lord, as we gather and worship today, we ask you to receive our love, receive our prayer. May all that we say and do today bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So before you're seated, greet a few people and suggest that you share a memory of someone whose faith inspired you as you greet. I do want to mention, by the way, before, don't forget the registration pads at the end of the pew, but prayer cards, anytime you want a prayer card, something you've got for prayer requests, you just put it in the offering plate. They should be at the end of the pews, and uh, just making sure you know. I'm done. Let's stand together, and we'll sing uh, our opening 
Uh, number 401, the Church's One Foundation, is going to be verses 1, 2, and 4. The Church's One Foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From him he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her and for her life he died. Elect from every nation, yet one o'er all the earth. Her charter of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one birth. One holy name she blesses, partakes one holy food. And to one hope she presses, with every grace endued. Yet she on earth hath union with God the three in one, and mystic sweet communion with those whose rest is one. O happy ones and holy, Lord, give us grace that we like them, the meek and lowly, on high may dwell with thee. And turn to hymn number 767. We're going to jump around a little bit here. We'll do verses 1, 2, 5, and 6. in bright array of King of glory passes on his way Alleluia Alleluia From earth's wide bounds From ocean's farthest coast of pearl streams in the countless holes, singing to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Alleluia, Alleluia. And please turn to number 670. 
We'll do uh, Make Me a Blessing. We'll do verses 1 and 3. and byways of life many are weary and sad carry the sunshine where darkness is rife making the sorrowing glad make me a blessing make me a blessing out of my life may Jesus shine make me a blessing oh Savior I pray make me a blessing to solve was given to you in your need love as the master loved you be to the helpless a helper indeed unto your mission be true make me a blessing Savior, I pray, make me a blessing to someone today. You may be seated. <laughs> Wouldn't it be neat if God answered the request of that song before you left church today? Made you a blessing to somebody here today? Um, I think he can do it, and I hope he does. And I think there's other people out there who just need to be blessed today. And you might be the very person to do it. So I encourage you to watch for those opportunities this Memorial Day weekend. As we prepare for our offering, if the de uh, ushers would come, I would point out that the deacons have got a note in the um, insert about the various offerings that are uh, been going on. If you want to catch up on any of those, you can follow through on that as well as part of the offering time. Let's bow together, shall we? <clears throat> Almighty God, we come before you, and we really have nothing to bring to you that you need. And what could we possibly bring to the one who made it all? The one who's far more powerful than anything we could possibly ever hope to be. But Lord, you give us the opportunity to be part of your work on earth. You Give us an opportunity through this to say thank you. And so, Lord, we bring our gifts, we bring our offerings, we bring our tithe. We ask you to bless them and bless the work that they do. Receive them as tokens of our love for you. In Jesus' name, amen.
At this time, if the deacons would come, we'll have our morning prayer, prayer time of year uh, with that service, and it's a special thing, and uh, I think very touching, and so I think it's important to remember, and uh, those of you that are here today, and, and that's you, and uh, you know, I remember the first Memorial Day after my parents passed away. You know, it's a, it's a special time. It's a tough time. It's a time to remember, and I pray God's blessing on you in the midst of the grief. Well, as we begin today, I want to go back. I mentioned Dad. Um, I want to go back a second to his uh, uh, funeral service, his memorial service. Um, night before, we had a visitation, you know, like they do, and people come. And uh, there were a couple guys that came and, and uh, were supposed to be sharing in the eulogy at the service the next day, business associates of, hers, of his that he really liked. And, and one of them came up to me. And he said to me, he says, okay, I have a question to ask you. He says, tomorrow when I get up and, and speak, what am I supposed to call you? He said, because I've always known you as Rick, but I, I hear I'm hearing everybody call you Richard and, and Rich. And I said, yeah, I said, it, it's, uh, there's all sorts of names. I said, you know, they, some call me Richard, some call me Rich, some call me Rick, some call me Dick. I said, oh, it, it depends on when in life they knew me and what the context was what name they use because Richard has so many variations. And I told, I told him, I said, you know, actually even here, you might even hear somebody come up and call me Ricky, you know, and uh, we laughed about it and he left and he no, he no more got halfway across the room and a guy came up and said, hey, Ricky, how are you? And I said, yeah, you know, that's one that knew me very young. Um, and what's funny about that is those, those two guys... Uh, one of them is Richard Miller, the other one is Dick Coleman, so I mean all of us, had, we got what was going on. You know, uh, Richard has so many different nicknames, and I also answer to Leland and Kevin and Brad and Cheryl, uh, those are the cousins and siblings in town, and so there was a confusion that happened. You know, uh, names are funny things. Uh, later in life, I, you, know, you grow up, you know the names of your aunts and uncles and everybody, well, I, I, later in life, I found out that I knew my aunts and uncles, but I didn't know their names. And I thought I did. Uh, because nobody used the right names. Um, in my dad's family, Sis was my aunt Nola Crooks. You know, my, my aunt Nola Crooks. Buck was Ira Huber. Blondie was James. Um, Ball was Dale. Junior was Leon. Jiggs was Gilbert. You know, and the mom's family was just as bad, only they didn't use nicknames so much. They just didn't use their first names. They used their middle names. And I didn't know that until one of them was uh, my aunt Imogene. I went to dad and I, and uh, mainly, were ended up being the legal guardians for my aunt Imogene when she was in the nursing home. And uh, we went over one time to, to the fir at this one place before we got everything all straightened out. We went over to check on her. And I asked at the desk, I said, well, okay, so what room is Imogene Wicks in? And they, they said, Imogene, we don't have, we've got a Jesse. I'm like, really? You know, I went down. Well, that was my Aunt Imogene. Turns out her name was Jesse. Uh, but she went by Imogene. That was her middle name. And Olita, uh, her, her name was Edith. And Nadine's name was Ollie. And I don't even know what Hazel's name was, but it wasn't the right name. And then my uncle was Red. You know, so there's all these nicknames. Um, sometimes they, they reflect characteristics, right? Like, like Red or Shorty, right? Um, sometimes they're, they're character traits, you know, like Slick or Buddy, right? Uh, you, do you know what your name means, your first name? Most of you, some of you? You ever look that up? I, most of us look that up. Sometimes our parents even looked it up when they gave us the name. I mean, sometimes they did it on purpose. And some of us know what our family names mean. I had a lady, I always tease people. I go, when I have to spell my name, I'll, even at banks, you know, I'll say, it's, it's crooks, like people that rob banks, you know. And then I say, well, some people call me rich, so it's rich crooks. That means I did it well. Well, I had a lady that was a friend of mine, an older lady, that was, she was a real saintly gal, and she goes, oh, I don't think you should do that. She goes, I think your name comes from, from the shepherds, with the shepherd crook, and all. so I, I, I'm going, I'll take that, that's okay, you know, probably not, but, you know, sounds good. We place a lot of importance on names. 
I kind of, I've enjoyed, having, having gone through the studies I've done in Hebrew, I've really come to enjoy the names in the Bible that used to just drive me nuts because, because almost all of them have a meaning, you know, and so as I read them, I, 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 I find that enriching, like, like we, we say Elimelech, but Elimelech is how it really, Elimelech means my God is king. You know, or Samuel mean, means God hears. Um, it's kind of, we put a lot of importance on names. And what's bad is I'm really bad at names. I have to work at it. Um, but think about names. I mean, if I mention the name Rockefeller, what comes to mind for you? I mean, you didn't have to think long, did you, to have something. Or what if I mentioned the name Lincoln? You know, or the name Billy Graham? You know? They bring reactions instantly. And, and, and all sorts of different reactions. Think, think about the emotional reactions as I listen, list several names. Uh, how do you react? Washington. Hitler. Nixon. Kennedy. Elway. Mantle. John Glenn. Gaga. That's not even a real name. I'm sorry. Um, Churchill, Charles Manson, Bin Laden, and dare I say Obama, Trump, or Clinton. You know, every name brings an association for us, brings a memory, brings an emotion. We, in, we all inherit names, but we also leave our mark on our names. You know, the mark we leave often has something that brings emotional reactions for others. I mean, think about it. If somebody out there that knows you mentions your name or hears your name mentioned, what, what, do, what do they think? You know, what's, what would be the reaction that people out there have when they hear your name? What are the images that we are imprinting upon our family names? The first of today's scriptures come out of out of first Second Timothy, the first chapter. Um, just a funny little funny little section. But verses five and six, Paul's writing to his young accomplice Timothy, and he says, "I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands." family lineage of Timothy, the faith part of his family, the faith that existed in Lois and Eunice, the heritage out of which Timothy came to know the Lord. Mother Lois, grandmother Eunice. I don't know if it's ever struck you as odd or not, but did you notice it's the maternal side that's listed? So often in the Bible it's, it's, it's the father's side. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, son of Jesse, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah. But here in Timothy's lineage, it's the mother's names that are given. Because probably it's his faith lineage. It's possible it's quoted this way because Acts tells us that on the maternal side, Timothy was Jewish. But on the paternal side, it was Gentile. His dad was Gentile, which, which then caused a little trouble that time Paul took him into the temple. And they were concerned about whether or not he belonged there. One of the reasons that may be the maternal side, maybe the faith thing, but it also is that during this period of history, the rabbis wrestled with Jewish lineage already, uh, partly because they were in a country occupied by Roman soldiers who pretty much had free reign to do whatever they wanted, wherever they wanted, whenever they wanted. And as a result, women, especially young women, were very much at risk. And so, it wasn't always easy to identify who a father might be. Or the woman might struggle because of the situation she'd found herself in. And so the rabbis early on decided, you know what, any child born of a Jewish woman is Jewish, is fully Jewish. That, was, that may be part of what was going on in some of this stuff. And these two ladies that are mentioned here, you know, they may well have uh, come to the faith early. In the early church, women were very quick to respond and very, very much in leadership roles in, in, in 
in helping to fund a lot of what happened in the early church, even listed there in the, in the stories from Pentecost. Paul appeals to Timothy's family name as he challenges Timi Timothy to carry on the faith, to carry on the torch. This Memorial Day weekend, I kind of want to challenge you that too. What's your faith family like? You know, who are the people in your life who have impacted you in the positive ways that have resulted in you being a believer in Christ today? Who are the people that have left their imprint upon your soul for whom we're indebted for eternity? What lessons did you learn from them? And, and as Paul admonishes Timothy, how are you doing it at carrying on the lessons and the heritage you've learned? You know? I mean, it's important. We're, we're part of a process. None of us are just here on our own. All of us receive the faith because of somebody somewhere who received it from somebody else and somebody else. Then the other passage, the second passage I want to look at is the one out of, out of uh, uh, Acts chapter 11. You know, one of the names that we inherit by being here today or, or, or we cling to when we become believers is the name Christian, right? Um, so we're going to take a second. I want to read this passage out of Acts 11. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but 11, just verses 25 and 26. Um, so Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. That's what the term first pops up. Christian. That's, that's actually a pretty significant name if you pay close attention to it. I mean, when you look at the word, you can see Christ right there embedded in the word, right? Um, it's what in, in Greek is called a diminutive. It's sort of a, a term of endearment, kind of. But it literally means little Christ. So when you go around saying, I'm a Christian, you're saying, I'm a little Christ. A little Christ. You know, in recent decades, we've, we've seen those little slogans, the WWJD, the What Would Jesus Do? I mean, it's kind of on its way out, I think. It was popular a few years ago. But the idea was that you were facing a decision or facing a choice. You, you'd try to figure out, well, how would Jesus respond? What would Jesus do? Well, that's totally appropriate if you stop and realize that being a Christian means you are to be a little Christ. You know, that, that we were, are to be reflecting what it is Jesus does with God's help. We seek to make our actions as Christ-like as possible as we follow him. That's one of the names that you bear in the world. Little Christ, Christian, if you know him as your Savior. In fact, I think in terms of Memorial Day weekend, you and I are living memorials for Jesus just by our name that we claim as Christian, as little Christ. So how are you doing living up to that name? That's a pretty big one, isn't it? That's a tough one. Um, but on the other side, think about the other thing we said earlier. What's the imprint you are leaving on the name Christian? You know, some people, what you live and say and do, that's their definition of what a Christian is because you're the only one they know. So what's the family mark we're leaving on that? And then I want to go another step in terms of names. In, in the Bible, names are often changed. You notice that? Uh, and often they're changed because of an experience with God or a promise that he gives or something. Abram becomes Abraham. Jacob becomes Israel. Simon becomes Peter. Saul becomes Paul. Right? Happens over and over. In our last passage uh, for today, uh, out, of, out of Acts chapter 4, there's another incident kind of along those lines. And, and this is kind of the core of the message today. Chapter 4, verse 36. Again, just a simple little verse. Thus Joseph, who is also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a Cy native of Cyprus, and it goes on and talks about stuff. Did you, did you know Barnabas' real name was Joseph? 
Barnabas is what we know him as, right? But that was a nickname. It was a nickname. Um, you know, there's an imprint that comes. And what, whatever happened with, with Barnabas, I mean, forever that name is associated with the kind of things that are tied in with encouragement, just like the name Nixon is always going to be bound up with Watergate. You know, that's always going to be there. Barnabas had this nickname, and that nickname was given to him by people that knew him. Now, do you know why? Have you read the stories? Do you know why Barnabas was given that name? Now, we don't know everything about Barnabas, but we know a couple of things. If you go back and you read there in Acts, you find that when Paul was first converted to Christianity, he had been out, you know this, I'm sure, been out persecuting Christians, trying to kill them, get them to jail. Well, he came to Jerusalem to meet with the church leaders, and nobody wanted to meet with him because they knew he'd been such a dangerous person. They were afraid of him. And it was Barnabas who came alongside Paul, Saul Paul, and took him before the elders, advocated for him, and encouraged him to stick with it and to talk to the people and made sure that Paul got a fair hearing. And so Paul's missionary career was secured by Barnabas, the encourager. In fact, when it came time for Paul to go on his first missionary journey, who went with him to keep him going? Barnabas, the encourager. And then later, Paul heads out on another missionary journey, and John Mark wanted to go with Paul, but Paul refused because Mark had quit the last time they went. And so Paul takes Silas and he goes on. But you know what happened to John Mark? Barnabas took him and went somewhere else. We don't know where they went. But again, Barnabas came alongside somebody and encouraged him and carried him forward. Because Barnabas stood up for Paul, because he then stood up for Mark on that journey, Later on, Paul and Mark were reconciled. But because of those two experiences, we have a book of the New Testament. I mean, if Barnabas hadn't come and stood alongside Paul, we wouldn't have Colossians, Ephesians, 1 Corinthians, Thessalonians, and probably most of the book of Acts, because Paul never would have made those journeys. And we wouldn't have the Gospel of Mark. And we probably wouldn't have much of Matthew and Luke in the way we've got them now because they used Mark as one of their sources. So this man named Barnabas, who we don't even have a book in the Bible from him, and his name wasn't really Barnabas anyway, is responsible for a good portion of the New Testament that you and I read because he was willing to encourage somebody else. He was willing to be second fiddle, the silent parter partner, the person that could see potential in somebody else and came alongside to help make sure that they achieved it. One time I was at a meeting some years ago, had a bunch of speakers at it, famous speakers, giving presentations, and then often you could go visit with them afterwards, and I, I didn't normally do that, but Ray and Ann Ortland were there, and they were two of the speakers, and, and they spoke, like they stood together and, and spoke, and it was really precious, uh, and the things they shared were, were just so refreshing, and, and it, was, it was different from the other things, and for me it was really, really helpful. So that day I, I got in line, and I, and I decided I wanted to say something to them. I ended up in front of Anne when I got up there, and I just said to her something about how you know, I really appreciated their message. It was, it was kind of a breath of fresh air, and a whole little different from everybody else. And, and I was actually kind of taken aback with her response, because not only did she say thanks, but then she looked at me and she says, you've got the gift of encouragement, don't you? I'd never thought about it. But that was her perception of, of what I had said to her that day. And I've never forgotten that. And every once in a while I, I look around, I see things happening. Well, maybe she's right. Maybe she's right. You know, so maybe I should have told Dick and Richard at the funeral, just call me Barnabas, you know, instead. Maybe that would have worked. Today's point is this. Based on your attitude, based on your behaviors, based on your character, based on your speech, what would be your nickname? And what would other Christians out there, what, what, would, what would people assign as the nickname for you in the faith? Would it be one that reflects well on the family name as a little Christ? Would it be one that would embarrass you or hurt your feelings? 
that they would never say to your face? Would it be one that describes the way you've taken your life to try to, try to reflect Jesus' name and, and to lift others up to him? You know, maybe it'd be kind of like Pilgrim's Progress. I don't know if you've read that or not, but, but they have all these little names that they use, like Greatheart and stuff like that. Well, maybe, maybe it'd be like True Friend or, or Special Angel or Humble How. Or maybe it's one that might need some tweaking. There's, you know, sometimes we need tweaking. Maybe, maybe the nickname would be Mr. Griper or Miss Persnickety or Johnny Judgmental. You know, and maybe, maybe it's one we don't like so well. What would, what would you like your nickname to be? What is it, you know, if you, you know, because I do these memorial services like we did for a number of these people up here, and I hear all these great stories about people and the way they touch their lives and, and the character traits and things that they admire and all that kind of stuff, and, and people identify very quickly, very easily, things that were the mark that these people left. And one day, somebody's going to do a funeral service for us, too. What is, what is it that we'd like to have remembered as that mark? as that nickname. What do you want the imprint on your family name to be? What, what if that, uh, that day when they preach yours and they come up with a nickname, they say, you know what the best nickname is for that person? Little Christ. Wouldn't that be something? Little Christ. Christian. Little Christ. I want to encourage you to take that dream and make it a reality. You know, you may not inspire somebody to write scriptures like Barnabas did for Paul and Mark, but you might Im inspire them to do something even more profound or just as profound. You never know. You're leaving an imprint on family, on the family name, on the name of First Baptist, on the name of American, on the name of Christian. I hope the imprint is one that you would be proud of. One that God would be proud of. But there's some, one other piece to all this about your name. And maybe this is the kicker, I don't know. You know, most of the time in Scripture, with these names that we mention, and especially when they get changed, it's God who assigns that name. Isaiah says that God calls us by name. And Revelation tells us there's going to come a time when we're going to be given a new name. So really it isn't the nickname that other people would give you that's the most important. It's the name that God has for you. And I guarantee you he has one for you. One that's uniquely designed for you. A unique name and a meaningful name and a powerful name. Maybe it's a humbling name. But it's a precious name. It's what God sees when he calls you and when he chose you and when he works on you. It's a name that belongs to you only because it comes from God. You can't create that name on your own. It has to be God's spirit working in your life. God is a willing and it says he's willing and working in his good pleasure in us to create us into being what he wants us to be. We just have to let him. We just have to be open to God changing us. To letting go of some things that maybe we need to let go of. Or taking risks that maybe we aren't so comfortable taking. Or learning character traits that Jesus himself reflected as we try to be better little Christ. You know, God's name for you is beautiful. And that day when it comes, when he shows it to you in person, I think we're all going to be overwhelmed that he saw in us the things that God sees. That's the name that's most important. The name of faith. Eunice and Lois. Believers at Antioch who were so following Jesus that the nickname they earned was Little Christ's. You know? Or Barnabas, whose encouraging spirit was evident to all. This morning is a simple sermon, simple topic. It's a memorial time, memorial day. Some of you will be visiting graves, some already have. 
Some will be sharing memories. And these people that we love have left imprints in our lives, as are we now. And God has a special imprint that he wants to leave just through you. And that's your name that he's given to you. As his little Christ today. Let's pray. God, it's amazing the way a name can mean so much. And how actions that we do may reverberate for generations. Lord, probably most of us are aware that we have some character traits that aren't so pretty. And if they nicknamed us after those, we'd be embarrassed. Lord, help us to conquer those things. Help us to be the kind of people that when somebody sees us, they really would want to call us a little Christ. Lord, it doesn't mean we're all going to be the same. We each have a unique name, a unique role. And maybe there's somebody here today that hasn't taken the name Christian yet. And today might be the day they come and give their lives to you. Or maybe there's somebody here today and, and they, they become a Christian, but they, 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 they're confused about what that niche is supposed to be, about where they need to be, what it is you want to create. And God, help them to see today what you're doing in their lives. Help us as we seek to discover that special name you have for each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our invitation hymn this morning is number 456. A nice little chorus. We're, just, we're going to sing it through a couple times. Um, because I think it's part of what we're talking about. What are those who come behind us going to find when they look back and see us? So we stand together. If you need to accept Christ, you want to join the church, you've got a, something maybe you need to get right with God, you'd like prayer, I'd like you to come forward as we sing. We're going to sing the song through t two times, Find Us Faithful, four, five, six. Would you stand? This morning, Daniel Wally's come forward because he wants to offer himself for church membership and baptism. And so we're going to schedule a baptism in a few weeks. He and I have been visiting, and, and of course Ron and Charlotte have been ministering to him for quite a while, and uh, we've seen him around a lot. So this is kind of a special day, Daniel. Congratulations. And I kind of I asked uh, beforehand some people about our, our normal process here. And I kind of got all sorts of different answers because it depends on the preacher. So I'd like to do this. All of you in favor of receiving Daniel into our membership of on baptism, you think it would be a good idea for him to be part of our body, would you raise your hand? I think they like you, Daniel. God bless you. So I want to ask you to, to stay up here afterwards because some people might want to come by and say hi. All right? And, uh, and then we'll schedule baptism, and I'll, I'll let people know ahead of time, because there might be some other people be interested in being baptized as well, so we'll make sure they know it. Uh, I also want to mention 
Uh, a few weeks ago, I had a little flyer that just some things about memory lane, different things to uh, remember people in your lives who've done some different things. And if you weren't here, I put some extra flyers back there. Uh, you might kind of enjoy having that to, to look at and to kind of think of this weekend. Let's bow together for prayer, shall we? Almighty God, we thank you for Daniel. We thank you for those whose uh, ministry has touched his life, especially Ron and Charlotte. God, we thank you for what you're doing, that you brought him to this point, and now he wants to be part of us officially, and he wants to uh, go through the waters of baptism following your command. Lord, we ask your blessing on him. And Lord, as we depart from this place, and we think about that song about the people that come after us, Lord, we try to be faithful, and it's hard sometimes, but give us the strength and the courage to keep on. And may the way we live our lives light the path for those to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. Stay up here with me. As you go today, I uh, was talking to somebody back here that the, the people picking up memorial flowers, we don't have names on them. Just feel, just anyone is fine. Just feel free to pick it up, all right? Thank you. God bless you.